Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Again, thank you guys uh, for the feedback. And please, if you guys think of things that you didn't bring up uh, during the debrief, we're going to have a couple more debrief sections. And then um, most of the last day in the boot camp on Friday is going to be all about making sure that all of the content is accessible for you all to be able to teach this uh, at your home institutions. So. There's going to be more time to provide feedback and let us know if there's anything else you need from us to help make teaching this at your home institutions easier. If you guys think of anything in the meantime, put it in the chat, send us an email, um, whatever's easier for you. And so um, getting back to the lecture material hook here, I have about uh, six or seven slides to go through and then we will jump to our next Jupyter notebook. So now that we have and raw expression table, we're ready to start analyzing our data. So this is usually a part of the pipeline that people consider more analysis than processing. And so that's why I kind of just separated this part out with RNA-seq data analysis. And so I, I guess I should ask, is there anyone who can't see my screen? Okay. Um, so as you guys recall, both in the Jupyter Notebooks and in the lecture material, we have gone through all of these steps of the workflow. I know I've gone over them a few times, so I won't go over them uh, again. But we're here now at the Create Raw Counts table. And I know in the notebooks, we used Lauren's Python script to do this. But in our uh, actual uh, processing pipeline, we use tax import, um, which is an R package to pull information from the genes.results files outputted from RSEM to create the table. And so now that we have our raw counts table, our next step is going to be to normalize uh, those counts. And so basically proposing this question here, we now have quantitative gene expression data. Are we, should say ready, I'll correct that, uh, to run DGE analysis? Well, not quite as many of you guys mentioned and pointed out throughout the boot camp. Although we've counted the number of reads aligned to each gene, we have not yet accounted for differences in read depth, the gene length, or RNA composition. And I'm just posing the question of why is this necessary? You guys can unmute your mics or put a message in the chat. Why is it gonna be necessary for us to normalize the data? Yeah, essentially be able to compare apples with apples to make sure we start all the samples on the same playing field, essentially. So I'm gonna go over these different types of normalization. So first is uh, read depth. So as you can see here, we have to account for sequencing depth in order to perform gene expression comparison between samples. So in this example that we have here, we see that each gene in sample A appears to have double the expression double the number of templates mapping to each one of these genes as compared with sample B. However, if we take a look at the read depth of sample A and sample B in this example, we see that the read depth of sample A is 100 million reads and the read depth of sample B is 50 million reads. And so that is likely what's accounting for the fact that each of these genes in sample A appear to have double the expression than the genes in sample B. It's just the nature of the fact that sample A, we have double the total number of reads as we do sample B. So we have to account for differences in read depth. And we also notice from the data that we've been working with that we see about a 20 million read uh, difference from our sample that was sequenced at the greatest depth compared to the least depth. So we are gonna have to account for those differences in read depth and normalize for them. Next thing to think about is if we want to normalize for gene length. And so as you can see here, this is going to be necessary, um, giving away an answer here to a question, but not so much for comparing sample to sample expression, but looking at gene length is going to help compare expression of different genes within the same sample. So in this example here, looking at sample A, we have... Um, what we see here is that it seems like just looking from top to bottom here at the templates that are being aligned to gene X and gene Y, it looks like there's roughly the same expression of gene X and gene Y 
However, if you look at these red dashes, which are representing uh, templates that were sequenced, you'll see about double the number of templates for gene X than gene Y. And that's just because gene X is about double the size of gene Y. And so if there were the same number of copies of gene X and gene Y, once you cut them all up and did the sequencing, you would end up with double the, uh, roughly, double the amount of templates that are mapping to gene X and gene Y just because gene X is longer than gene Y. The other thing that we want to consider is RNA composition. So when we're selecting which type of normalization we want to do to account for read depth, one thing we have to think about is the possibility of there being some type of contaminant or a very strongly differentially expressed gene. You can think in the context of if you're doing a comparison, let's say if you're curious about the function of NF kappa B in your sample, and so you run an experiment where you overexpress NF kappa B in one sample, um, and then um, don't overexpress it in another and do RNA seq on those data, you would have to account for the fact that, of course, when you overexpress uh, a gene, you're going to have many, many more copies of that gene in your RNA seq data. And so if you were to go through and just compare based on total number of reads here, even though we're seeing about half the uh, reads mapping to these genes in sample B. If you do a normalization compared to the total number of reads you, without taking into account the uh, RNA composition or the, light, the possibility of either a contaminant that's really highly expressed in one sample and not the other, or if you um, add in something like an overexpression gene accounting for that, then when you do your uh, comparative analysis, you would basically be dividing this by a much larger number, which would kind of minimize the differences between your other genes uh, of interest here. So taking into account RNA composition is going to be very important when you want to compare expression in uh, one sample versus another, or I should say groups of sample versus another. So of these three different ways to normalize or different types of normalizations that can be performed, which ones will need to be accounted for to perform differential gene expression analysis. So I talked about three different differences that could uh, happen in our data. So one is read depth, another is gene length, and this one here, RNA composition. So which ones are going to cause an impact if we don't normalize them before we do differential expression analysis? So Mark, so a lot of you guys are saying all. So keep in mind when we do differential gene expression analysis, we're comparing expression of genes from one group of samples to another group of samples, right? So if we don't account for gene length in any of our samples, Will it matter when we do comparison? So if we don't account for gene length in sample A, but we also don't account for gene length in sample B, when we go to compare expression of that gene in sample A and sample B, will that matter? Yeah, no, it's kind of like when you make the same error in all of your samples, um, and so it kind of essentially cancels it out when you do a comparative analysis. So. In fact, when you're doing differential gene expression analysis, you don't have to account for gene length. When it's important to account for gene length, if let's say we're looking in this case in sample A, and we want to know the expression of gene X in sample A relative to the expression of gene Y, again, in sample A, so comparing gene expression to gene expression within the same sample, we're going to have to account for differences in uh, gene length. In that case. And then, of course, if you do account for differences in gene length in one set of samples, then you would have to account for gene length in your other set of samples as well in order to do differential expression analysis. But if you don't account for gene length in any of your samples, then you could still do comparative differential expression analysis. You just wouldn't be able to be confident in comparing um, gene X to gene Y in this example within each sample. So really for differential expression analysis, we definitely want to make sure we normalize for read depth and RNA composition. That is a must.
And then gene length, it depends on if you want to do a comparative analysis of expression of certain genes within each of your samples, then you would want to account for gene length, but not necessary to do differential expression analysis. And so there's a variety of different normalization methods out there that can be used and they normalize in slightly different ways. So this table lists um, a few of them. Yeah, five listed here. I'll quickly go over these. Um, Lauren's gonna go over um, a lot of this stuff in a lot more depth in the stats lecture. So one type of normalization method, and these are all set up with the normalization method and then in parentheses, some tools that normalize in that manner. So one way to normalize is counts per million. And then this is a description, it's just how the calculation is done. So to generate counts per million or CPM, you would take the total reads in each sample divide it by a million, and that'll give you a scaling factor for each sample. And then you would divide the gene counts by that per million scaling factor for each gene for each sample's uh, scaling factor. And that would account for sequencing depth. So this tells you of those three normalization, uh, three different differences to normalize for which one it accounts for. So this accounts for sequencing depth. And so the uses here would be to compare gene counts between replicates of the same group, but because this method does not account for RNA composition, so the possibility of having one really strongly differentially expressed gene or a contamination in one sample that's driving um, the number of uh, templates that you have sequenced, it wouldn't account for that. And so I wouldn't recommend using this normalization method for differential expression analysis. You'll notice that some of these methods are used um, for differential expression. So as you're reading literature and stuff and you're coming across these things and thinking about which uh, data that you want to trust to form new hypotheses, take into account the normalizations that are, are being done. Another type of normalization is similar to CPM. This is reads per fragment per kilobase million or RPKM. It also could be fragments per kilobase per million. Um, which makes more sense when considering thinking about paradigm data, which you have fragments that are being aligned. Um, RSEM will, as we guys, as we saw, it will output and calculate the counts in this manner. And so essentially this is, you would do this calculation by performing the same calculation you did with CPM, but then take those CPM values and divide it by the length of the gene in kilobases. And what this does is now, in addition to accounting for sequencing depth, it'll also account for gene length. So this will allow you to compare gene counts between genes within a sample. But again, because it's not accounting for the RNA composition, I still wouldn't recommend this for um, doing differential expression analysis between sample groups. This other method here, transcripts per kilobase million, which some of you guys might have seen, uh, in RNA-seq data, uh, TPM. So RSEM also gives us expression in TPM. Uh, Salmon and Callisto are two of those pseudomappers that we talked about in the alignment section. They also uh, give you quantitation data in uh, TPM or transcripts per kilobase million. So this is very similar to um, RPKM, FPKM that we just went over, but it just differs in the order of operations. So in TPM, what it does is read counts are first divided by the length of each gene in kilobases, and then the sum of all the reads per kilobase values in each sample is divided by a million to give you that scaling factor, and then each RPK value is divided by that per million scaling factor. And this again will give you um, account will account for sequencing depth, and it'll also account for gene length. And again, so usage would be similar to RPKM, FPKM to compare gene counts within a sample or between samples of the same group. But again, because it doesn't take into account RNA composition, um, I wouldn't recommend it for differential expression analysis. A couple more normalization methods. So median of ratios, which is used by DEC2. This is the one that we use at Gene Lab. Uh, in DEC2, a size factor is calculated for each sample by dividing the median ratio of all gene counts by the geometric mean of each gene across all samples. And then the raw counts for each samples are divided by the sample specific size factor for each gene. 
And don't worry, I know that's a mouthful. Lauren is gonna go through this with you guys in uh, a lot of detail with examples. So you'll understand how that median of ratios is calculated to do the normalization. And this is gonna account for sequencing depth and RNA composition. And so as we discussed, when you're doing differential expression com comparison of one group to another, you wanna make sure you're accounting for differences in read depth and RNA composition. DDC2 median of ratio methods does both. And so this is can be used to compare gene counts between samples, but because this doesn't take into account gene length on its own, you wouldn't want to use this for within sample comparison. So comparing the expression of one gene to the next within one sample, um, but it can be used um, for differential expression analysis. And then again, just want to bring up the point um, that in GLAB, when we pull in our RSEM count data, those raw values, we do it using a program called Tax Import in R, and that does account for gene length. So the data that we publish on GLAB differential expression data does account and normalize for all three. And then just this last normalization method that I'm going to go over quickly here is the trimmed mean of M values or TMM. This is used by Edge R. And then a variation of TMM where it adds in gene length correction, TMM, or G-E-T-M-M. So this is the total read count, or the RPK that we talked about in the previous slide, is corrected by a normalization factor, which is calculated using a weighted mean of the log expression ratios between samples after trimming. So because it uses that weighted mean, it'll account for the RNA composition and then you can scale it to a uh, per million reads. So this can account for sequencing depth and RNA composition. If you don't use the gene length correction, so just the TMM will account for sequencing depth and RNA composition. So TMM is fine to use for differential expression analysis. But then if you also perform that last step, uh, the gene length correction, then it can account for gene length too, and then you can use it to compare gene counts between and within um, if you use the GTMM samples and for differential expression analysis. Um, this is the type of normalization that you use is probably on the in silico side where you can have the most impact on your data. So there are several uh, papers out there that compare all of these different tools that are available across the pipeline for processing RNA-seq data. And you do see some differences depending on which type of trimming you use, not too much with the trimming, more so the settings of the trimming than the tools that compare different types of aligners and also mappers. And you do see some differences with those, um, especially with the low expressing genes, depending on which aligner or if you use a mapper in that step of the analysis. Quantitation too, depending on how you quantitate those multi-mapped reads will give you um, differences. But really which makes the biggest impact in your data is this step here. After you have those raw expression values, how you normalize them is gonna account for the biggest changes in differential gene expression analysis. So keeping that in mind. So we're going to discuss the DDC2 normalization in greater detail in the RNA-seq uh, stats lecture that Lauren will present. And after the count data are normalized, we can then begin differential gene expression analysis. So after we go through and do our median of ratios normalization, we can then do the very last step of the pipeline, which is differential gene expression analysis. And for this, we use DDC2 to do that analysis. And just to go over what that is, we would now be ready to determine the probability of each gene's expression being significantly different in one of our groups of interest through a pairwise or a multiple comparisons testing. Pairwise being if we were to compare one group with another, uh, multiple comparisons similar like an ANOVA test. Again, Lauren's going to go over this in the stats lecture. There are, just like all the other steps in this pipeline, there are several tools available for differential gene expression analysis. They differ in the type of distribution that's used to create the model to fit the count data for the statistical testing, and also they can differ in the type of statistical test that's used. Again, we're going to get into some of that statistics in uh, the statistics lecture. And then just a quick summary here of different types of differential expression tools that are available. And I should mention, I know I go through and at each step, I show you guys uh, several different tools that are available for each step of the pipeline and links to those tools. 
by no mean are these lists comprehensive. So I just tried to pick tools that are more commonly used that, that at least I've seen in my experience and our, my colleagues have seen. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a ton of different options for tools at just about every step of the pipeline. So just a few of the more common ones I give you in these slides. So as I mentioned, we use DESeq2. The link to the documentation is here. It uses a negative binomial distribution model, and the statistical test that it uses is a wall test for pairwise comparison. And then if you want to do multiple comparison testing, it uses a likelihood ratio test, which is similar to an ANOVA. Um, Limavoom is another one that's commonly used. This was originally developed to analyze microarray data, and they modified it, the dash boom, um, to also be utilized for RNA-seq data. So this is similar to a T distribution with an empirical Bayes approach. So that's the uh, mathematical model that's used to fit these data to do the comparative analysis. And the statistical test it uses is a, a version of a moderated version of the T test. There's also uh, EDGAR, and again, links to all of these. Uh, EDGAR also, similar to DEC2, uses negative binomial, except the statistical test that it uses to do the statistics for the comparative analysis is an exact test. There's BASIC, um, which again uses a negative binomial distribution assumption. And the statistical test that uses is a posterior probability um, through a Bayesian approach. And then there's EBSEQ, empirical bias seq, which uses a negative binomial beta empirical bias Bayes model. Um, and then the statistical test used in this tool is a posterior probability through Bayesian approach. And so we are going to get into a lot more detail about the statistics with the method that we use at GeneLab. Um, and then once we perform differential expression analysis, we can then um, visualize our data. So we can create some data visualizations to help interpret uh, count and differential gene expression data. So the, some of the plots that we're going to be doing in this boot camp include the principal component analysis plot which will show us how our samples cluster in three-dimensional or multi-dimensional space, I should say. The clustered heat map, which gives a heat map to show um, just a general overview of expression in each of our samples of all genes. And we're also going to be generating a volcano plot, which is going to be able to show us differentially expressed genes based on set full change cutoff values, as well as p-values and or adjusted p-values that we provide to the plot. And so again, Lauren's going to go over all of this in more detail uh, in the upcoming days. But initially, are there any kind of initial questions about the concepts behind why we do any of these steps? Like I said, the details we're going to get into. Okay, excellent. That brings us to the end of our RNA-seq overview. Uh, slide deck, which was a beast of a slide deck to get through. Before I hand it over to Lauren, I first want everyone to revisit their SMCE instance. And if you haven't done so already, um, go ahead and save your outputs. If you want to export your notebook along with all of, with everything that we have generated throughout the notebook, you go to file save and export notebook as, and then save it as an HTML file. And so you can go ahead and um, save this notebook anywhere on your desktop. And then once you've saved your completed notebook, you are good to X out of it um, if you want to. Again, everything will be saved in the notebook in your home directory. And if you guys want to go through this again from start to finish, uh, which I highly recommend, you should go ahead and click kernel, restart kernel and clear all outputs. However, as a reminder, once you do that, all the outputs that you have generated throughout the bootcamp thus far will be completely cleared away. So just make sure that you save anything before you uh, restart your kernel and clear all outputs. So that said, Good to go. If you guys are comfortable, you can X out, you can leave it up, um, whatever you prefer. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing and you can finally stop hearing my voice. I know I'm sick of it and uh, Lauren will pick up with the next Jupyter Notebook. So take it away, Lauren. Thank you. First of all, big round of applause to Amanda. Thank you so much for taking us through the FASTQ counts. This is a, a huge accomplishment. Thank you to everyone for sticking with us. 
And now we get to come to the differential gene expression analysis and visualization. So let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. And then um, you should now over in your file tree, you should have a notebook called RNA-seq underscore DGE um, underscore JN. 0622.ipynb and it should say something like seconds ago. Mine says 18 minutes ago because that's when I copied mine over. Yours should say seconds ago and please go ahead and double click on that and open up that notebook. When you have that notebook open, and I, I also put the name of the notebook here in the chat so you can be sure you're double clicking on the right one should say pipeline for performing differential gene expression analysis and the kernel i am also putting the kernel in the chat please everyone double check in the top right hand corner that it says r conda and gl for u dash r so if anyone is having an issue with this please let me know All right, great. I'll keep an eye on the chat. Um, so let me know if you run into the issues, but I'm gonna keep going in the meantime. <clears throat> All right, so this is a notebook uh, written in R. So it's running an R kernel. Every cell here is designed to receive and interpret commands written in the R language, unless they are markdown cells, in which case it's just text explaining uh, the commands that we're running. This um, the notebook contains the gene lab pipeline for performing differential gene expression analysis. So as the description says, we're going to determine significantly differentially expressed genes in the soleus muscle of mice that were flown in space above uh, aboard the ISS. So we're comparing space flight or flight animals versus mice that were kept in environmental simulator on Earth. So these are uh, animals that were kept in a uh, in a housing situation that was similar to the one on the ISS, but kept on Earth. So these are the ground control animals, or GC. Uh, this is from NASA's Rodent Research One mission. And we're gonna start with the RSEM raw counts table that we just generated at the end of the RNA-seq vascular counts uh, Jupyter notebook. So we again have a workflow here showing the different tools that we're gonna use and steps we're gonna take. So as I mentioned, we're starting out with raw counts. And one of the first things that we're going to do is um, to make a principal component analysis plot. For those of you not familiar with this plot, I am going to go over it before we get to this point in the notebook. I'll go over it in the stats lecture. Um, we're going to take the raw counts, we're going to create a DC data set object. So this is a special data structure in R that is required for the DEseq to R library. <clears throat> and that's the library that performs uh, differential gene expression analysis. And so we take the raw counts, we also take sample metadata. So which samples are flight, which samples are ground control. All of this gets wrapped up into a special DEseq data set object. Then we run the DSeq2 algorithm after we load in the, um, the DSeq R library. This algorithm has three steps, size factor estimation, which is the median of ratios normalization that Amanda was just talking about to take into account differences in sequencing depth. We'll also create another PCA plot to take a look at how the uh, patterns within the data have changed from before we did the normalization, after we did the normalization. So we'll make that comparison. We'll also uh, correct for um, overly variant, uh, variant genes by estimating gene dispersions. <clears throat> and then um, I apologize, um, everything where I live is blooming. And so I'm having the worst allergies and uh, like kind of losing my voice. So I apologize. I might have to mute and drink water or cough from time to time. Um, so the third step in the DSeq2 algorithm 
is the hypothesis testing. So um, this is where we test the hypothesis whether or not each gene is significantly differentially expressed. Again, I'm going to go over this in the stats lecture. And we use the Wald test as our hypothesis test. Something I'll go over. We create a table of genes and whether or not they're differentially expressed by assigning p-values and adjusted p-values, log to full change, and the Wald statistic. We add in the gene annotations and at the end, we create three visualizations to explore the differential gene expression data. So that's the workflow. We can always refer back to this to see where we are. Let's go ahead and scroll down. We have a table of contents. Um, and let's go to the first step in this notebook, which is loading in the R libraries. So, um, as I mentioned, we're using the R programming language, and we went over R in the R intro notebook, where I reviewed the fact that um, the R base installation comes with a lot of packages, but there are many packages that we want to use for analysis that are not installed in the base installation. So we have to install them, and then we have to load them into the instance. So everything has already been installed for us um in this content environment so um all we have to do is import these libraries into our currently running instance so i have a note here that every time we restart our kernel we are going to have to rerun all of these code blocks in fact um unlike in the fast queue to counts notebook where we just had to rerun that one um code block that where we defined all of the path variables here every cell that we run builds on the one before so we're constantly updating variables so whenever we come back to this um, notebook after we've killed the kernel we're going to have to rerun every single code block up to where we stopped so that's fine uh, none of this takes very long to run but we just will have to run through everything all right, so let's go ahead and import the libraries that we're going to use for our analysis. Recall that we import libraries using the R function called library. And remember, R functions are the syntax is the name of the function and then open close parentheses with um, whatever argument we're passing in, in between the parentheses. And so let's go ahead and run uh, first, we're importing that library that Amanda mentioned, tax import. Then we're going to import a bunch of our libraries that will allow us to run DG analysis with DSeq2. So the first is uh, the DSeq2 library, and then several auxiliary libraries that uh, DSeq2 and subsequent analyses call on for uh, different analyses. So go ahead and run this cell. Mine is still running with a little asterisk. You see um, we are getting some output in this uh, pink block here. It's just telling us that as we're loading in these packages, it actually needs to load other packages because they're package interdependencies. So I'm just looking through here really quickly to see if I see anything that looks like an error. None of this looks like an error to me. It's just telling me um, Lots of packages were attached. All right, everything looks good to me. If anyone else got an error, please let me know. But this is all normal. We then are going to import uh, several libraries that will help us with the data visualization. So ggplot2 is a commonly used library in R for making pretty plots. And then we're going to use the complex heat map and enhanced volcano packages to make the heat map and volcano plot that Amanda talked about. So you can go ahead and run that cell. Again, we get some pink output. And just looking at the output here. Yeah, so why are some of these packages masked? Um, my understanding is that pa um, packages are masked if there's a package already installed with the package you're trying to install that um, would conflict with um, the packages that are being masked. So there are, there's often code that's shared between packages and um, it, there can be version um, conflicts. So if there are versioning conflicts or code interdependency conflicts, 
then you end up with some code being masked. All right, and then finally, we're going to import two libraries that will allow us to add gene annotations to the DG output table. So um, Amanda noted that the uh, the counts table that we currently have, these are ensemble gene IDs, but sometimes we want other gene, other types of gene annotations. Um, and so we've now accessed two different databases that will allow us to map ensemble gene IDs to other types of gene IDs. So that's the string database and the panther database. Right, more pink output, but no errors. Everything appears to have loaded successfully. All right, did anybody get anything different here? Or has everybody's packages have loaded successfully, hopefully? All right, great. All right, so the next thing that we need to do um, brings us to step one, important format data. So as you recall, at the beginning of the FASTQ to counts notebook, we set up directory path variables and we're going to do the same thing here. So we have uh, directories that have been set up for calling in the metadata and the counts data that we um, wrote out from the previous notebook. And then we have output folders, um, which will write your output data into your home directory. So as you recall, the way um, to, we're defining paths as, as strings in R, and strings are um, couched in quotation marks so that R doesn't think that they're variables. And then the variables are just standalone here at the beginning. All right, let's go ahead and run that cell. And then we can move on to actually importing the data. So the first thing that we're going to do is import a metadata file that we're going to use to inform DSeq2 about uh, which group each sample belongs to, flight or ground control, which we abbreviate FLT or GC. We're going to compare both of these groups in our DGE analysis. So that's the first uh, type of file that we need to import. And then secondly, we need to import the unnormalized expression data file. So that's the RSEM raw counts table that we just created after running the RSEM quantification at the end of the fast feed counts Jupyter notebook. So first, the first cell that I have here, I've pre-populated um, and you'll notice some familiar, hopefully, syntax from the intro to R notebook. We're reading in a file called GLDS104 group metadata.csv. So this is a CSV file. And this is something, uh, this is a file that Amanda put together. We didn't necessarily work with it before. And so we're just going to read it in and um, use it. So it's been set up to have sample name and then the group. And you may recall that we went through how to use the read.csv function to read in a CSV file, you specify an argument that this data does have a header. Um, it has row names in the first column. Um, this is a, an argument that we didn't go over, um, which specifies that R should read in strings as factors. So factors are a specific data structure in R. We don't need to go into details there. And then recall that we use the file.path function to stitch together the um, variable that points to a specific path to a directory. We're stitching together this variable, metadata dir, which we just defined up here. And so we're stitching together this long path to our metadata folder. So instead of typing that out, taking up lots of room, we can just say metadata dir. And then within that directory, we know is our metadata file. So we can just read in this file using read.csv and assign it to a variable called sample table. So let's go ahead and run this cell. You should not get any output because the read.csv um, function is assigning all of the output to the sample table variable. So there's no output from the cell, but 
we can take a look at the data stored in this new variable we just created, sample table, by running the next cell, which been, has been pre-populated. And recall that we can just um, see what's stored in a variable in, um, in the Jupyter Notebook by just putting the variable into the cell and running the cell. So as you can see, this small table is what was contained in the metadata CSV file. The first column, which we read in as the row names, the first column has sample names, and the second column has the uh, group to which each sample belongs, and we call that condition, so flight or ground control. And as you um, can see here, so R will, in a Jupyter notebook, if you look at a data frame, R will tell you the data type of whatever data is in that column. So you can see it says here FCT, that stands for factor because we told R to read in strings as factors. Right. All right, so we now have a data frame. It has samples and the condition. The next thing that we need to do is um, there's some code that we do not need to get into in detail here, although you may notice some familiar code here. Some of this is just beyond the scope of this workshop. You don't need to get into it. The point of this sample block or this code block is to uh, take information from this data frame, which is formatted um, in a, you know, a nice human readable way and format it so uh, that it's um, readable by DC2. So DC2 requires a specific format. So let's go ahead and run the cell. You can ignore the warning message. Uh, that's normal. And then the next thing that we have to do is uh, take the um, output here and define all of the group comparisons that we're going to use for uh, DGE. So uh, we'll see what that means in just a second. Um, but so DC2 takes in, is designed to take in a set of contrasts. That's the term that DC2 uses. We can think of these as simply the groups that we're going to compare for DG. So this is purposefully a little bit vague because we're going to get into the details in a moment. But let's go ahead and run the next code block, which will set up these contrasts. Um, and then I want you guys to go ahead and we've just created a table in a variable called contrasts. So go ahead and run the next cell, which will show you the contrast table that contains the group comparisons that we just defined. Um, and then let's use this contrast table to answer the following questions. So I don't know um, if these questions are available in Mentimeter or if I should make a poll. Um, yeah, Lauren, they're available. Okay, great. Um, I can put the link in the chat once more. Thank you. All right, is it going to refresh and show the question, how many comparisons are shown and what are they? It should. Let me present. Did it update? Yes, it did. Okay, perfect. So. Um, and then I can send the results link to you if you don't have it. Okay. Uh, yes, I don't think I have it. Thank you. So um, if everyone please use the Mentimeter link, take a look at the contrasts table. So this is a, a specific format that DC2 requires. Um, so we're going to, in a minute, we're going to tell DC2, you know, this sample belongs to this group. And then please use these contrasts to compare the groups the way we want them compared. So how many comparisons are shown and what are they? Um. 
Lauren, I just sent the results link over to you. And we've got six answers so far. Got nine. All right, we can go ahead and close the voting. All right, so let's, let's just show the answers here. Okay, two, flight versus GC, GC versus flight, two, compares two groups two ways, flight versus GC, GC versus flight, four, flight versus GC, GC versus flight, flight. Okay, um, two comparisons, two, one, two comparisons, two, two. Okay, so let's take a look at this contrasts table on my screen here so if i run this cell the contrasts variable um, we can think about how to interpret this so um, as i said um, this is a specific and special format that dc2 requires so we're going to we're going to give DC2 access to this table where it can map samples and conditions, but it needs to know um, how to compare the conditions. So we're, we're asking the question, are, is gene um, differentially expressed, you know, in one group compared to the other? Which groups do we want to compare and in which order? So um, DC2 requires a little table like this with the name of the contrast as the column name uh, and the contrast uh, and the two conditions, the two factors in, uh, in the column. So there are two contrasts shown here. There's the flight versus ground control contrast where we are comparing flight versus ground control. So we're saying in the flight group, versus the ground control group find genes that are significantly differentially expressed up in flight versus ground. And then we're doing the opposite in the second contrast. So ground control versus flight, we're saying which genes are significantly differentially expressed in ground control as compared to flight. All right, so um, this question we're going to come back to after I have had a chance to go over the first part of the stats lecture. So if you wouldn't mind saving that for later, Armin. Um, the next thing that we're going to do the, is uh, moving on from the metadata table, we're now going to import the RSEM raw gene counts data table that we generated at the very end of the last notebook. So um, here you can see we are again using the read.csv function and we're using the file path function to stitch together a variable that holds a path to a directory and then the name of a uh, CSV file that's in that directory. So we've used this syntax before. We're now wrapping this, we're wrapping all of um, this, uh, the output of read CSV, and we're wrapping that into a new, um, a new function that I don't think we've seen before called as.matrix. And all this is doing is recall that the read.csv function outputs a data frame. It's a specific data structure in R. Well, DC2 uh, would prefer a matrix data structure as input rather than a data frame structure as input. So we're taking the data frame that comes out of read.csv and we're converting it to a matrix before we even assign it to the variable. So here we've nested actually three different uh, functions together, kind of passing the output of each function to the next one to achieve our desired result. Are there any questions about uh, the sort of nifty little syntax that we've put here? Okay. 
All right. So we can go ahead and run this cell. We now have a new um, a new variable called raw counts. And from our raw counts variable and our contrasts table and our sample table, we can take all, all of this information together and move on to step 1.1c, which is um, creating the DEseq dataset object. So the DEseq2 algorithm requires this input uh, called DEseq dataset. It's a format that DEseq2 can use for DGE analysis, and it specifically holds um, gene expression data and sample group assignments. So rather than having your expression data in one variable and the sample group assignments in the other in another variable, and then your contrasts, the, the contrasts you want to perform in another variable, the DSeq dataset object takes everything in. So we're going to use a function that's provided by DSeq2 called DEseq dataset from matrix. Yeah, thank you, Amanda. Um, and this will convert all of uh, the metadata and the raw counts data into a DEseq dataset object. So this function takes in at least three arguments. First, the matrix of counts data, which we just read in, and you can see this function is literally called make a DEC data set from a matrix. Um, so you can see why we had to convert the data frame to a matrix, because this function tells you right in the name that it, it requires a matrix, not a data frame. So first we pass in our matrix of counts data, which we, we read in, it's in our variable raw counts. We also need to pass in the metadata table, describing which group each sample belongs to, and here that's our sample table variable. We read that in up here, sample table. And then thirdly, the condition in the metadata table um, that DC2 is going to use to group these samples for the comparisons. So uh, we only have one condition column in our sample table, and that's just titled condition. So that's what we're going to use to group samples um, for as either flight or ground control for DG analysis. So you could imagine um, a more complex analysis where you have different experimental conditions and you want DG, uh, DC2 to perform comparisons on all of them. Here we just have one experimental condition, flight versus uh, ground control. We're doing two different contrasts because we want to find genes that are up in flight versus ground control. And we want to do the opposite, find genes that are up in ground control compared to flight. So the resulting DSeq dataset object, which uh, you can see here, we are going to define as a variable called DDS holds the counts data and the group assignments for each sample in um, what's called a design formula. So I think of D, a DC data set object as kind of this complex data structure that has different slots for um, any data that you read in, you add in, and then as you continue doing analysis, more data is inserted into the different slots. So right now we're filling in the slot for the raw counts data. And then we're also filling in the slot for the sample metadata and the column in that metadata that we want to use for the comparisons. Later on, we're going to normalize our data. So there's going to be a new slot for the normalized counts data. And um, then we're going to do differential gene expression analysis. So there's going to be a new slot for the results of that analysis. So it's this kind of um, flexible and ever growing data structure that um, instead of having lots of variables to hold on to the, all the different data types, they're all in this one data structure and you can just access them using different commands. All right, so the first thing that I want us to do is try running the command below where we're going to call the DSeq dataset from matrix um, function. We're going to pass in three arguments, raw counts, which is our sample table, and then the column name of the sample table where we want to group the samples. Um, but we're going to get an error, and we're going to try to figure out why we get that error. So the, this, these questions are not in Mentimeter, so just go ahead and shout it out or put it in the chat. Uh, what happens when you try to run this 
when you try to run this cell? What error do you get? Some value is not integer. It doesn't like it. All right. Yeah. Some value, the values in the table is not whole integers. It's causing the error. Right. Exactly. Okay. So, um, yeah. So why do you think this happened? It's because some values in the table are not integers. So recall, right, the RSM raw counts table is not composed of only integers. Why is this? Do you guys remember? Shout out from the chat. Why do we have decimals? Uh, the most likelihood estimation that has to incorporate it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, every, every, yeah, so, so close, Susie, right, um, and, and yeah, Ty, so it's exactly, so Ty, you said multiple line reads, so these are reads that align to multiple locations in the genome, and, and then, um, I think Wajin said, um, to deal with that problem, RSM uses the maximum likelihood estimation to assign a probability for each, uh, read to be assigned to a different gene. So those probabilities are not always 100%, so we get decimals. So um, as you can see, DSeq2 doesn't like this, um, which is crazy to me, by the way, because DSeq2 is designed for RNA-seq data. And everyone knows, I don't know, that RNA-seq data has this problem. But anyway, this, this really surprised me the first time I used DSeq2. However, um, we now, since DC2 cannot deal with um, non-integer values, we need to format the raw counts data frame so that these counts data are compatible with DC2. We need to convert the integers, and we need to convert these decimal values into integers. And so do you remember that I kind of made a big deal about a specific R function that we can use to round decimal values up to the nearest integer? That's kind of an interesting name. Maybe you guys remember it from the R intro notebook. Do you guys remember the R function we can use? Ceiling. Nice. All right. Very good. Yeah, exactly. So let's go ahead and in this empty cell here, um, can you guys remember the syntax to round all values in a data frame up to the nearest integer using the ceiling, uh, the ceiling function. So recall in R, functions are the function name and then open close parentheses with the uh, argument that you're passing in uh, on the inside of the parentheses. And uh, so can you guys figure out the syntax and you can go ahead and put it in the chat to, yeah. Exactly, Mark, except does anybody um, know what we can do slightly differently from the syntax that Mark uh, put here? Do we need an exclamation point? Exactly, right. So, mm -hmm. so that is, it, Mark, if we were running a Unix command in Right, so in, an, in a Python kernel, we would use the exclamation point here. This is an R kernel. It's an R notebook. It's all set up to take an R command. So we don't need, the, we don't need to do any, anything fancy here. So we can run ceiling raw counts. Now, what happens when we run this here in this, in this cell? We get a pretty big output to the screen here, right? So did we change this? variable at all? Have we made any changes to the raw counts variable by just running ceiling raw counts? No, right, exactly. It shows you the values, but it doesn't change the actual data frame. So if, if anyone's not clear on this, please uh, shout out. I can go a little bit slower. Um, 
but so what happened here is uh, we just output the results of running ceiling on raw counts to to the screen. We didn't actually change the raw counts variable. So since we want to be able to use the raw counts variable to successfully create our DC data set object here, let's actually change our, our raw counts variable by assigning the output of ceiling back to that variable. So we do that, remember, with the arrow, the assignment operator. And um, now we can run this cell and we shouldn't get any output because the output of the ceiling function has been reassigned back to the raw counts variable, okay? Did you see that? Okay, so finally we can try again, copy our this this line, the DDS, DSeq data set for matrix line, copy that line into this new um, empty cell here and go ahead and run it again. And all you should see here is a little pink message that says converting counts to integer mode. Um, which does not mean, obviously, that DSeq2 was actually able to convert anything to integer. All it means is that it's, um, it has taken the counts data and made sure that it, they are being held as the integer data types. So there are different, right, different data types in R. There are integers, there are floats, um, and it's just making sure that the counts are being held as integers, okay? Does anybody not see this output? All right, great. Okay, now recall that we can use um, the summary function to look at, we used it in the intro, our notebook to look at a mathematical summary of a data frame. We can also use it just to look at um, a summary of the data that's held in a data structure. So uh, go, please go ahead and run this cell. And um, based on the output that you get, please answer the following question, which I believe should be in a um, multimeter, mentimeter. Um, how many genes are stored in the DEC data set object? Do we have that question, Armin? Oh, good. There. There yep, we go. Yep, it's up right now. Great. Thank you. And I am starting the countdown. All right. Got four votes so far. Five now. Six. Woo. Keep going. <laughs> Doing great. <laughs> Does anybody not get output from the summary command? 10 seconds. All right. Voting's closed. All right. So those of you who did not get a chance to answer, please let me know if uh, this isn't clear. But let's uh, take a look at the results. Uh, everyone who answered had the same answer, 55,487. Let's take a look here. I run summary on our DEC data set object. Let's see, it says DEC data set object of length uh, 55,487 with zero metadata columns. So I kind of asked you to extrapolate a little bit with this question. Nowhere does it say anything about genes. But uh, knowing that we uh, don't have 55,000 samples, 
we have 12 samples, um, and that there are, you know, 30 to 50,000 annotated genes um, in a given mammalian genome. This is a pretty good guess. So we, we can see our d sick data set object has 55, uh, a little over 55,000 genes stored in that object, okay? If anyone is not clear on what's going on here, please let me know. All right, so um, the reason that um, the DSeq data set object is kind of formatted or it's discussed this way where like the length is genes. Remember I was talking about how this data structure has different slots. Well, um, the calculations that we're going to be doing are on a gene by gene basis. So we're asking for each gene, is this gene differentially expressed? So there's a, there's a, a slot for each gene where new information will be put. So a, a p-value, an adjusted p-value, so on and so forth. So that's why uh, DC2 thinks of the DC data set object as, as having a length where uh, each unit of length is a different gene. All right, so now recall that at the end of the last notebook, we noted that there was a gene with zero uh, expression across all samples. And Amanda noted, uh, um, oh, I was having so much fun that I uh, lost track of time. And Amanda has just reminded me that we're at the end of the day. Uh, it's okay, we're gonna do so much fun stuff tomorrow. Um, now that we're at the end of the day, you are able to um, let's, um, save your notebook by going to File, Save and Export Notebook as HTML, and then you'll be able to save it locally. And everyone, please remember to log out um, or stop your server by going to Log Out here under File or Hub Control Panel.